Stephen Canals is one of the producers and co-creators behind FX's Pose. Just earned his first Emmy nomination last year. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Stephen. And so season one airs, it gets this great reception. And heading into season two, what were the discussions in the writer's room about what you wanted to do with this season? Yeah, you know, Heading into season two, we had a lot of discussions about a time jump and what that would do for the narrative, you know, what we would gain um, and what we could explore. Um, I think collectively, one of the things that we knew we wanted to start our narrative with was the um, emergence on the scene of Ballroom through uh, Madonna's song Vogue and how it popularized this, you know, beautiful um, part of ballroom. And so once we landed on that decision, then we just spent a lot of time talking about what was really prevalent and important and what was happening within the community at that time, at this point being 1990 in New York City. Um, and obviously we had spent time during our first season um, leaning into and discussing HIV AIDS and the ways that it affected the entire community. And so it became really critically important to us to lean even further into that with season two. And so um, you see Billy Porter's character, Pray Tell, joining ACT UP. And, you know, there's a lot more um, politics, I think, embedded in the narrative this season. And that certainly was intentional on our part. You know, I think um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that we obviously, as a, as a writer's room, we're paying attention to the current administration. And so I think a lot of uh, the policies that have um, recently gone in place and, and um, the ways that LGBTQ people have been targeted by this current administration certainly lent itself to us creating a narrative that in many ways, I think, addressed that. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that Madonna Vogue video, um, it's a really interesting plot line, especially at the beginning, where it's really introducing mainstream America to ball culture and wanting to learn the moves. And there's some mixed feelings among some of the characters in the show. It's a really sort of a tense dynamic of this marginalized community suddenly having their world kind of appropriated a little bit and people mm -hmm. having different feelings on that. So could you just talk about what you wanted to explore with that, especially as this way of kicking off season two? Yeah, I mean, I think that what's really important and key for our audience to know is that, you know, no one person can represent an entire community um, or group. And so, you know, I think one of the things that we wanted to address is the fact that ballroom as a community is not a monolith. You know, every individual has their own thoughts and opinions and feelings about things that were happening. And I think if you were to talk to any of the ballroom elders, folks who were involved in ballroom at that time, I think for the most part, um, my experience has been that a lot of people have talked about Vogue, um, as well as the documentary Paris is Burning, um, with reverence, um, because it obviously aided in, in introducing their community to the mainstream. With that said, I think there are some folks who would also articulate that, you know, there were a lot of challenges that came along with that too. And so for us, I think what we wanted to do is, is craft a narrative that really investigated both sides of that argument. You know, and I think you see that most in, in Blanca, you know, played by MJ Rodriguez, that at the start of the season, she felt so strongly in her bones that this was going to be a great opportunity. And this was going to be a time for not only the community, but specifically for her house and for her children to go out into the mainstream and have the life that they all have been striving to have. Um, and I think by the end of the season, you realize that for some people, that happened, like we see that through Damon's arc, and then for other folks, it didn't. Um, and, you know, and, and that's obviously, that's true to life. Um, and so I think that was the thing that we wanted to to really lean into. We, we're always looking as as a group to 
right to the authentic experiences of the, the individuals whose lives we're capturing on the show. Yeah. And I also just wanted to ask about um, writing out Evan Peters and Kate Mara and James Vanderbeek in season two and just what went into that decision. You know, I think that for us, it had everything to do with feeling like that storyline had gone as far as we could take it. You know, we had specifically, because we meet Kate and Evan and James's characters really through Angel, right? Yeah. So uh, Evan Peters played the character Stan, who, who begins this relationship with Angel played by India Moore. Um, and, you know, our arc for Angel in that first season was about her becoming a woman with agency, you know, and by the end of that first season, she makes the choice to no longer pursue a relationship with Stan. Um, and I think that the conversations that we had in the room when thinking about the construction of the narrative for season two is, if we reintroduce these characters, if we bring Stan back as a, a part of Angel's storyline, are we then reneging on all of the setup that we did throughout the entire first season where we saw her getting to a point where she could stand on her own two feet and say, I don't need you. Um, and so I think that ultimately for us was really important, was to not take that away from her as a character and not to take that away from the audience either. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And I think season two, the show gets even deeper, sort of like you were saying, more political, more emotional, as the characters are dealing with the AIDS crisis and becoming active in the ACT UP movement. And there's a lot of tragedy and discrimination that still goes on, but you still also really balance it out with humor and so many great reads you know for people like Electra and there's this great blend of comedy and drama how much emphasis is there when you're writing an episode on making sure to keep that balance you know I think that it's just a natural and organic part of writing an episode of Pose I mean the reality is that our story takes place in the late 80s and early 90s, right? And we have situated our narrative and our characters right in the midst of both the HIV AIDS epidemic as well as the crack epidemic. Um, as someone who grew up in New York City at that time, I, I was raised in the Bronx, I know that that was a very bleak time for New York City. Um, I also know, though, that there was a lot of love and there was family and there was humor and levity at which obviously ballroom outside of representing family and love also represents. And so I think for us as a, as a room, and certainly when thinking about constructing the narrative for the show, it's just leaning into the truth and leaning into what it meant, to, what it means to live a life, you know, like no one person is just one thing, right? So I think for us, it's about um, writing all facets of what it means to exist, right? The happy parts and the sad parts. And so when we're writing an episode of Pose, I think for us, it's just, it's just a natural balance of you know, there are going to be some moments. I think a, a great example of that is in episode nine, when the women go on, um, they go on a trip, you know, they go to, to the coast and um, there's a woman at dinner who is really nasty with the women and an Electra played by Dominique Jackson then reads her to filth over it, you know? And I think like, that's just one of those moments where I think that's a perfect example of what our show is, right? It's like, that's a very real moment. That's absolutely an experience that I think many people have had and certainly some of the women on our show have had in real life um and that is their response to it you know there we certainly could have played that more dramatically um you know but but the truth is that you know sometimes in that truthfulness you know in that response there is a ton of humor um and so for us it's always it's just writing to to that honest moment mm -hmm. 
And you have been a producer and a writer on Pose from the very beginning, but you made the big leap this year to directing an episode. Mm -hmm. It was your directorial debut, episode eight, which was a very climactic episode where uh, the house of Angelista starts to break apart. Um, what 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 gave you the itch to sort of make that leap, especially for that episode in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. I well, I studied film undergrad um, at Binghamton University, and I I always knew at some point in my career that I would get behind the camera. Um, and I'm fortunate to have a. Uh, wonderful relationship and a friendship and a mentorship with Ryan Murphy, who going into the second season, you know, said, I think now is the time. Um, and I'm also really deeply appreciative that I had the opportunity to not only direct Revelations, but to also write the episode. Um, you know, for me, being able to get behind the camera was all about enriching my relationship with the cast. Um, you know, as a creator, and certainly as, as a writer, um, you know, I have tons of conversations with the cast about story and about character arcs. Um, but being the person who's actually directing the episode, you know, it takes that relationship to a whole new level because I'm now not talking about simply talking about the characters, but I'm also modulating their performances, you know, and in many ways, I'm now. I'm in the mud with them, you know, collectively together, we're now crafting a scene. So it isn't simply me telling them as a writer, this was my intention, um, but it's now us spending time thinking about visually, what will that look like, um, you know, and having a, a deeper collaborative relationship. Um, so, so that I was really looking forward to and really excited about um, and, and glad that um, both Ryan and FX trusted me enough to to make my directorial debut. And season two ends on a really very beautiful note of Blanca and Pratel really taking this pair of homeless teenagers under their wings. Um, how did you land there that this would be the right moment, the right note to end on? Yeah, I mean, you know, in many ways, it's funny, I've heard from quite a few fans of the show who, you know, they'll usually say the, the first season was so hopeful and it was all about family and the second season definitely was darker, I think. And I agree, I think the second season we took much bigger swings narratively and it felt really important to make those choices. Um, I think for us, though, ultimately the story has always been about family at its core and so when thinking about the construction of of that finale in particular and what we were working toward and i should note that you know we always had a sense of where the season would go i we I collectively as a writer's room hadn't discussed early on what that final image would be you know unlike the first season we knew we were going to end on blanca becoming mother of the year the second season we weren't as clear like you know like we know what we're, we're kind of working towards thematically but you know what that final image is we hadn't quite landed on it yet and it was in the midst of writing um episodes eight and nine um that we landed on oh it would be really great because the, the season we've really seen all of our core family members kind of go off in different directions and really start to live their lives independent of one another. And so we wanted to bring that sense of family back, you know, and, and remind the audience that at its core, you know, ballroom has always represented a safety net, um, but that the show is also about family. And so that really was the way that that's, that was our entryway into that particular ending and inviting and introducing um, these two new folks who, you know, hopefully will help to re-energize and revamp the House of Evangelista. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I want to go back to last year where you and your fellow producers were nominated for Best Drama Series, mm -hmm. and you made history as the first Latinx producer nominated for Best Drama Series. Janet Mock made history. Our Lady J made history. And when you see these kinds of firsts, you know, I think it's a little bittersweet because I imagine it's amazing to make history like that. But, you know, at the same time, it feels like it's taken so long to get there. And it's like we're still celebrating these firsts in 2019 wow. that probably should have happened way before now. Can you just talk about your memories of getting nominated and attending the ceremony and also just that sense of making history? I mean, I will take you back even prior to to the nomination, just being in the conversation mm -hmm. um, was mind blowing for me, you know, like as a, a young queer boy from the Bronx, um, you know, that was so much bigger, I think, than I could have ever allowed myself to dream. Um, so to be in conversation for drama series, um, you know, to have my, um, my work be in the same breath as some of the other shows that were nominated that I really truly revere from artists whose work I admire, you know, like that in itself was mind blowing. And so that morning when the nominations were announced and I, I saw the, the clip where Pose was said as one of the eight shows nominated for drama series, I was floored. I was so blown away. I mean, it, outside of just the historic moment of seeing folks like myself and Janet and Our Lady J and Silas Howard, mm -hmm. all being queer and trans people being nominated for the first time in this particular category, um, just that we all represent the individuals who are on the show, you know, like it's, it's not that we're being nominated for our work, but, you know, we are, we're pulling from our own experiences, you know, like so much of what you see on camera on pose and so many of those scenes are coming from very real experiences that we all have had personally, you know, and, and there are, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, really going going through therapy, if you will, while we're in our writer's room and unpacking experiences that we've had and then finding a way to to dramatize that and use that for story. And so that nomination was, it was um, so humbling and really bittersweet for all of us involved to say, wow, like we, you know, we really put a lot of hard work and effort and um, have really opened ourselves up emotionally. And it, you know, to have that lovely response from our community just meant so much. Outside of the fact that this is also a show about black and brown, queer and trans people, you know, and I can't help but reflect on the two, almost two and a half years of going in and out of rooms. And, you know, I had 167 meetings before meeting Sherry Marsh, who's one of our executive producers, who then introduced me to Ryan Murphy. 167, you know, over the course of, you know, nearly two and a half years. And so, you know, and to spend all that time hearing people say, a show like this will never have a life. You know, there isn't an audience for a show like this. I don't know where, what network a show like this lives on. So to have found a home with FX and to have someone like Ryan Murphy come in and say, we are absolutely going to make this show. You know, it's, it's incredible. It was so mind blowing to see our show up there as one of the nominees. And, and then obviously then to see Billy win mm -hmm. in the lead actor category, it just, it really, I, I, even almost a year later, like it's still really hard for me to wrap my brain around. Cause I think I'd started taking in the messaging that maybe there isn't room for a show like this to exist, you know? So to be, to be a, a member of the LGBTQ plus community who's created a show about LGBT people that then makes its way to the Emmy stage is, is it's kind of beyond words. <laughs> That's, it's an incredible journey. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Stephen, for talking to us today. We really appreciate it.
Thank you. Um, for those of you watching, hit like and subscribe for more Emmy season interviews just like this and head to goldderby.com to start making your Emmy predictions.